Father, we thank you for your love towards us. We thank you for your great mercies. We thank you for the Sabbath. We pray as we have come together here today that you will cleanse us, that we may receive your word. We thank you that you're dealing with each one of us as individuals, but you're also building a church. Help us to see that you're not going to save anybody by themselves. It's the body you're saving, the body of Jesus. Help us to understand, help us to move forward, help us be, to become better prepared to help someone else. We thank you that you receive us where we are, but you don't leave us there. You move us to higher ground. May we keep moving with you. Bless us today as we open our minds and our hearts to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I have already received one question. If you have questions or something you want to talk about, be sure to get them to me before we get involved here. The first question that's uh, hit today is something about people who are called independents. I don't know if many of you have been uh, aware of some of that. Maybe I should do a little bit of history because I have been involved in the history. I was there when all of this stuff started. I was invited to the initial meetings, so I know what was happening. And I'm talking about even meetings before any of it surfaced. <laughs> all right, so let me go back maybe 12 years ago, maybe a little longer now. I'm losing track of it because it got back <laughs> yeah, maybe 15, 16 years, something. But a while back, the church was feeling some motion. And that motion was felt by administration in a very interesting way. And the church members probably don't know about that part of it. But the administrators were made aware that the tithe was dropping off. And if there's something that will get people's attention, it's when the money starts leaving. <laughs> So the tithe is dropping down, and they were researching, doing all kinds of stuff, trying to figure out what's going on. How come the tithe is dropping now? Well, I had my own particular views at that time, and I didn't say a lot, but then some other things started happening. Doctrines started popping up. A doctrine here, a doctrine there. And of course, any time a doctrine came up, it was called new light. It's always new light. It's never anything else. Well, the people who came up with these new doctrines were kind of an interesting group. Uh, this thing all focused, and the church became aware of it when a fellow by the name of Desmond Ford uh, was saying some things, interesting things, such as, there is no such thing as an investigative judgment. Now, I don't know about you, but as a Seventh-day Adventist, that got my attention right away. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. This is a Seventh-day Adventist professor saying there is no investigative judgment? And the next thing he said was, nothing happened in 1844. <laughs> I thought this is really interesting. The denomination is paying this man to say these kinds of things in our schools. <laughs> well, not everyone is aware that's what he was saying, but then he said it at Loma Linda one time, and that caught everybody's attention. And the reason he said it was a, name by, a man by the name of Paxton was invited by Loma Linda University to speak. Paxton was not a Seventh-day Adventist. He was from Australia and he was pretty sharp. But he and a fellow by the name of Brinsmead, if you know that name, he and Brinsmead got together and they were agreeing on something. They were agreeing that the Adventists were wrong. <laughs> now Brinsmead, back in the 50s, stood up with a message called the Awake Message to wake Seventh-day Adventists up to do what the Bible and the Spirit Prophecy says. And so here he is surfacing in the 70s saying the Adventists are wrong. And he's got a Sunday keeper with him and they're making the rounds. And Paxton uh, thought he was a pretty good theologian. And I don't know how far I should go into this history with you, but some of you may not be aware of any of these things. <laughs> 
Loma Linda University invited both of them to speak. And so they went to Loma Linda University and they spoke and they said their piece. And Desmond Ford stood up and agreed with them. And that was the undoing of Desmond Ford because all of a sudden everybody knew what he was saying. <laughs> now, when all of this happened, the church administration uh, knew it was going on, but they figured they could contain it, they could deal, work with it. I mean, we believe in freedom of conscience, don't we, as a people? <laughs> but the administration does not squish people because they disagree about something, okay? And that's a good thing. But for some reason, this all got out of hand, and it appears that several people throughout the denomination began saying things that were no longer Seventh-day Adventist. And because this was happening within the framework of the organization, there was a reaction. And the only reason I told you this much was to tell you about the reaction. A grassroots movement began from, from the lay people. And they didn't like what they were hearing at these levels. And so they started asking, what's going on? As they should have. <laughs> But then a very interesting thing happened. And this is where you're going to put on your thinking cap. All of a sudden, individuals started standing up saying, we have the truth. And then they started traveling, having meetings in the various churches, pulling the people, telling them what was wrong with this movement and what Adventists were supposed to be saying. And one by one, individuals started standing up to do that. The interesting thing is that if you go back into the history, you will discover that most of them were ex-ministers. They were not lay people as lay people alone. They were ex-ministers. And if you go into the background, you'll find out that each one of these had a problem. Okay? It's a very interesting thing. I know most of these people personally, and I know what some of the problems are firsthand. <laughs> now, I've never gone around saying anything about this, but this is what started that particular movement. It was not a lay movement at all. It was disgruntled ministers. And each of these ministers had a message. And what most people don't know is they were in touch with each other, and they were in league with each other to get a certain thing done. That didn't surface until years later. And today, most of them are in close communication with each other. When something goes wrong, they all get together as a unit. Okay? Now, I'm not going to get into all of that. But what came out of that was a group of people saying that they were independent ministers. And to be fair, they did not coin the term themselves. The denomination called them independence, and they liked it. <laughs> so they accepted the term, independent. Now, the word independent is not a good Bible word. <laughs> okay? To be independent of God's movement and His setup, the way He does it, is not a good thing according to the Bible. There's no such thing as one person having such a superior judgment that they can go against a whole church and say, I'm right and you're wrong. There's something wrong with that. Yeah. Now, let's, let's move from that little background because that was prophesied, by the way, that that would happen in our ranks. The people who were surprised didn't know prophecy, but the people who knew prophecy saw, here it is. Okay? And I have very often told people, once they have discovered there is apostasy in the Seventh Adventist Church. And there is. But when a person discovers that, and all of a sudden they get all excited and they want to do something about it, I ask them, where have you been? You just discovered we have problems in the church. <laughs> where have you been? <laughs> and I remind them, that the very first problems that this people had that is recorded was back in 1886. 
said 1886. And actually, it was reported about something that went wrong in 1885. <laughs> so we had one good year, maybe. Maybe we just don't know everything. <laughs> How come there are problems in God's church? Why? Because you're in it and I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. <laughs> yeah, just think about that for a second. <laughs> this is not a perfect church because we are in it. <laughs> if you want to see a perfect church, you better get out. <laughs> and I have told that to some of these reformers <laughs> because they thought they were going to make the perfect church and I told them, you have a problem. You're in it. <laughs> And I can say that with a straight face because I know it's the truth. The person that does not recognize there is corruption in them does not know Jesus Christ. Because the closer you come to Jesus, the more corrupt you become in your own eyes. That is the law of the Spirit. Okay? So, how are we supposed to relate to these kinds of things when people are throwing magazines at us saying, the church is wrong, the church is that, the church is that. When they're throwing videos at us, telling us all the spirit of prophecy quotes that say, the church can't do this, the church can't do that. What are we supposed to do? Well, what's our attitude supposed to be about that? Well, I want to remind you of a man that God tested in just that way. Yeah, his name was Moses. <laughs> yeah. The children of Israel had blown it. That's a million and a half people out there. Yes. And Moses was trying to figure out what comes next. How do you deal with these people? And God came to him and said, Well, I'll tell you what, I understand your problem. Why don't you step aside? I'll take care of it. He says, I'm going to kill all of them and start over with you. <laughs> You're the good one. And the rest of them, forget it. I want you to separate from them. Do you get that? God told him, be a separationist. <laughs> Why did God tell him that? Did he, does God believe in being a separationist? I don't think so. What was he doing with Moses? He wanted to see what he was made of. He knew, but he wanted Moses to understand it. And what did Moses say? Oh, he said, no, oh, Lord, I'll go with them too. <laughs> We're all together. And God said, come on, step aside. I'm going to take care of this. And I said, no, I can't do it. He said, that you won't do it either, will you, Lord? <laughs> he started telling him, you, you don't believe in that. I know you don't. <laughs> you know, Moses is right. God does not believe in it. I think we need to understand it. God does not believe in separation. What does God believe in? The unity of his people because it's the only way he can prove who he is. A person either receives the spirit of Jesus or they have a different spirit. And the spirit of Jesus in each one of his children does the same thing. It makes them a family. So Moses passed the test. And God says, all right. We'll work this out. You know, there was another occasion, and we've talked about this a little bit. Another occasion, remember, a million and a half people. And God told those people, go over there and take the land. I've given it to you. And we know they sent spies. The spies came back, and all of them but two people said, we can't do this. They're too big over there. <laughs> that land is terrible. It'll swallow us up. We'll all die. 
And two men said, well, God said he gave it to you. <laughs> the people picked up rocks to stone these two men. But God stepped in again. And he says, well, you people don't believe you can go in. You will not accept it when I tell you it's yours, so you're not going in. That's what you believe. Now, I hope that we can understand what that story is really all about. We are going to get what we believe. If we believe in sin, we're never going to be able to handle it. Never. But if we believe what God says about it, then we get his solution. Okay? We get what we believe. Now, when uh, God talked to them some more, he said, well, you were over there for 40 days spying out the land, coming up with the wrong thing. We're going to give you each day and turn it into a year. And that's how long we hold you in a holding pattern in the desert, wandering around. Do you know that you can get across that desert in a jeep today in about six hours? <laughs> they were there wandering around in that place for 40 years. <laughs> they could have gone across in 11 days just walking. But as soon as they got over there, God turned them around, and then they went over here, and then he turned them around, and they came over here 40 years. That's miserable. But that's how long it took to kill off that whole group. They died in the desert. All of them, except the two. Now, I want to ask you a question. This is why I'm telling you this story. You know it. How much apostasy is two saved people out of a million and a half? Do you get it? Now, if I was going to write a paper and put it out or send out a videotape, do you think I could have made something out of that? Oh, a million and a half people were apostate. What kind of a church is that? Only two faithful ones. Oh, I think I could make a pretty good case of getting out of that group. But did God do that? No. Who was the real group? Those two. <laughs> you never look at the apostasy and call that God's church. That is what the devil does. Okay? Okay? Does the Bible have anything to say about this subject? It's there, right in front of us. The whole Bible is against the independent movement that takes people out of God's church. The whole Bible is against it. Spirit of Prophecy has a lot of very specific things to say, but I wasn't asked about the Spirit of Prophecy. Maybe we could look at one scripture so you get the idea. Let's go over to Jeremiah. Let me see if I can find the scripture here. Jeremiah, the fourth chapter. I just want you to look at one verse with me. Fourth chapter, verse 22. For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good. They have no knowledge. That sounds pretty bad to me. <laughs> they don't know how to do good. They just know how to do evil. But what did he call them? <laughs> he 
didn't say, my used to be people. <laughs> he didn't say, those apostate children, forget it. I don't want them anymore. That is not the way God talks. He says, return to me, you backsliding children, that I may heal you. But he does it as a people. He always holds his people together. You know, we're in Revelation 18. In verse 4, he says, come out of her. Okay. Come out of, come out of Babylon. Come out of the confusion. Come out of... But he's talking to his people, his children in all these churches. They belong to God. And he says, come. But does he say, just get out, and then he tells them, be an individual? No. They're to come into the third angel's message. They now become the third angel. They come out of Babylon to tell the people about Jesus in the sanctuary, to talk about the judgment, to tell them about the Sabbath, to tell them about the state of the dead, the way it really is. You come out of Babylon to learn the truth and give it to other people. So God is never a separationist. He's always bringing his people t together. Let me... In the book Maranatha... On page 269, it says, when, uh, well, I better go back up a little bit. It says, the decree will go forth. And this is first in this country, remember, as we studied, and then in the Europe, and then in the third world countries, a decree will go forth. It says, a decree will go forth that they must disregard the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and honor the first day or lose their lives. Now, is this serious, isn't it? This is real. The whole world is going to say to Sabbath keepers, you either keep Sunday holy or we're going to kill you. That's where it's going to go. Then it says, if they will not yield and trample under their feet the Sabbath of the Lord and honor and institution of, of the papacy, Satan's host and wicked men will surround them and exult over them because they will... Will seem to, there will seem to be no way of escape for them. When this time of trouble comes, every case is pro, uh, decided. There's no longer probation, no longer mercy for the impenitent. The seal of the living God is upon his people. Now, it says it's over, and God's put his seal upon his people. Who are his people? Is it somebody that says, I will not be part of the church? Is it somebody that says, I'm out here by myself? I will believe what I want to believe, and I don't care what the Bible or anybody else says. The seal that goes upon God's people is upon those who are loyal to Him and do it His way, the way He says. Nobody else. Seal upon his people. This small remnant. What's that sound like? This small remnant. Unable to defend themselves in the deadly conflict of the powers of earth. That are marshaled by the dragon host. Make God their defense. The decree has been passed by the highest earthly authority. That they shall worship the beast and receive his mark. Under pain of persecution and death. I saw the saints suffering great mental anguish. They seemed to be surrounded by the wicked inhabitants of the earth. Every appearance was against them. Some began to fear that God had at last left them to perish by the hand of the wicked. Remnant. Little group. One body of people and they all believe the same way. 
And they are not saying, I don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> I'm living. All right, I'll ask you one last thing on this subject. Maybe you have some other questions in this area. Jesus gave some very, very clear information on this subject. He talked about wheat, and he talked about chaff. Now, anybody who's dealt with this, when you put it in a basket, you have the wheat and the chaff in there, what do they do with the basket? <laughs> yeah, and, and what's happening when they do that? Yeah, the wind is blowing it, isn't it? It's, what's it blowing away? Not the wheat. Where does the wheat go? <laughs> so, God's going to do some separating. He's going to do it. And guess what's blown away? The ones that separate from God's church, the wheat, are the chaff. When a person chooses to leave, they have just made themselves the chaff. The wheat stays in the basket. <laughs> so, I've just given you three instances. We could do the whole Bible. It's all about this subject. It's about unity. God's people must stay together. As a matter of fact, we have clear, clear counsel and spirit prophecy. Press together. Press together. Press together. It says it three times like that. Every time you'll find it. What, shouldn't we pay attention to that? The people who think they're historical Adventists? Press together. <laughs> we are not all going to agree about everything. It's not going to happen. We don't all think the same. But all of us here will know the seventh day is the Sabbath of God. There's going to be no confusion on that. We will all know that Jesus is in, he is in heaven as the high priest. There's no confusion about that. We will all know that when a person is dead, they're really dead. <laughs> no confusion. That's where we're supposed to stay together. And that's what we're supposed to tell people. They can find that in the Bible, any Bible, even the Jehovah's Witness Bible. If you show them, it's there. But when you want to start talking about little details here and there that's not really part of our message, be careful. God is not going to help you convince people. <laughs> and that's what creates the division. We don't need it. Let's stay together in those areas that we know, we all agree, that's Seventh-day Adventism. That's where God wants us to be. And that's what we're to tell people. They don't know these things. So, I'm glad for the question because sometimes these things don't come up unless you say something. <laughs> okay? But the Bible is against the independent spirit. The first independent spirit was in heaven. And you know what he's called? He's got lots of names. But the one that sticks with me is over there in Revelation 12. Verse 9. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. That was at the cross. Now it's come. Jesus has done it at the cross and the resurrection. And it says, and the power of his Christ for the, what? The accuser of the brethren is cast down. Who is that? Remember that. Always the accuser of the brethren is a devil. Devil. 
I hope you put away the papers that come to your house when you recognize what you have coming to your house. Have you invited the devil to your house? I hope you know what to do with some of those videos, too. I can make this stick. It's biblical. It's spirit of prophecy. Notice what it says here. The accuser of the brother and his cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They talk like Christians and they won't put garbage in front of them. They loved not their lives unto the death. You know, when I first read that years and years ago, I thought that meant they were willing to be martyrs. But that's not what the Scripture is saying. It's how they became Christians. They loved not their lives unto the death. They died. They allowed Jesus to resurrect them. It's not something they're going to do. It's something they've done. Remember the one-liner in Spirit Prophecy. The living is easy after you're dead. <laughs> That's what makes Christianity so tough. People are not dead. <laughs> We've got to learn it. We've got to know it's real and God expects it. Nothing happens until the death. Resurrection can't happen until there's death. And so it says here, they love not their lives unto death. Verse 12, therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Rejoice. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Now they can rejoice in heaven because the devil can't bother them anymore. But we have a problem here. <laughs> this says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and sea, for the devil's come down to you having great wrath because what's the because he knows he knows get that he knows there's no question in his mind he has a short time he's done he's through he's dead Jesus defeated him he's not going to defeat him <laughs> he's already done it there is no court of final appeal that Satan can go to now and get this reversed. It's done. It's over. And Jesus slipped through his fingers. When he died and was resurrected, he went to heaven and Satan can't go there anymore. He cannot bother Jesus firsthand anymore. But who can he bother? <laughs> And so that's where he's turned his attention. <laughs> so do you see why we have problems in the church? The devil has the world. He doesn't have to do a single thing. He has it. He has every lost person. He doesn't have to do a thing. The only issue with him are people who call themselves Christians. And he's got to make sure they don't make it all the way through. And he's got lots of tricks. Being an independent is one of them. Now I realize there are a lot of honest people who have gotten over there and they don't understand these things. But I have to tell you this, before it's over, they're going to understand and they're going to have to make a choice. In volume 6 of the testimonies it says that Jesus is going to move in on this whole situation. He's going to take the reins in his own hands. And the question is asked, what power in heaven and earth can stop him when he does it? All right. So, when he begins developing the church triumphant, ever heard the term? Yeah, we are the church militant right now. But when Jesus begins developing the church triumphant, and he starts getting rid of the chaff, and the wheat, that pure wheat, remains the real church. 
And that remnant is developed. I'd rather imagine that when it becomes apparent that the church has been purified by Christ himself. Can you see this individual coming from someplace and saying, Oh, the church is pure now. I guess I'll come back. Gonna be a little tough. <laughs> Where were you when it was hard? Why did you leave? We are told. I'm telling you these things because it's all prophetic. It was all there. In the spirit prophecy, we were told. And you know these things. The bitterest test. The bitterest test that any of us will ever have to meet. The bitterest test we will have to meet is our own brethren. Well, I have told this to the leaders of these various groups too. Guess who failed the test? When a person leaves, they failed the test. We're supposed to stick in there and meet the test. <laughs> okay, I'll give you one last one and I'll get off this for now. Unless you have a question or comment. A real Christian a real Christian connected to Jesus Christ has the spirit has the command of all the heavenly gifts because that's what a Christian has that person in a church full of apostasy what will that one person do it will leaven that church towards righteousness one person who is a real Christian in a church will leaven that church for God. But do you know the independents say it a different way? They say that apostate church will leaven the Christian and turn him into a non-Christian. The Bible doesn't say that, neither does the spirit prophecy. God says it the other way. So we need to get our perspectives right. Am I going to do it according to God's ways? According to my understanding of the character of Jesus? Okay, here's a question. What happens to those who were disfellowshipped from the organized church? Well, uh, that's not enough of, of a question for me. Because I happen to know that there are several people who did things that deserved disfellowshipping. But they were heroes in their own minds. When a person makes themselves obnoxious and gets themselves kicked out, who made it happen? <laughs> yeah. So, there's not enough here. Now, I'll say this. There is a possibility of a true Christian being asked to leave a fellowship. Yes, that's happened in the past. If that happens, that Christian is to leave. They have been invited to leave. They're not to fight. They're not to say, hey, you can't kick me out. Jesus didn't do that. If they tell you to leave, you leave. But you better be sure it was for Jesus Christ and not for yourself. Because Peter, we're told that, that we are going to suffer. He says, but what kind of glory do you get if you suffer because of all the weird things you did? <laughs> Where do they go? Another church. And I have news for you. If a person cannot find a church anywhere to go to where the people recognize them as a Christian, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> okay? Because what that is saying is God doesn't have a church. And that's exactly what the Babylonian hollerers are saying. God doesn't have a church. That, by the way, is in Testimonies to Ministers, page 58. I don't give you my opinions. I have pages in my head for these things. Page 58. And on page 22, she declares point blank that anybody who says this church is Babylon does not have a message from God. Clear? As soon as that word comes out of their mouth, you know, they don't come from God. All right, that's enough on that. 
This is important though because Revelation 18 is about Babylon. Don't ever think the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon or you have fallen into a big trap. And the devil is willing to help anyone who wants to go there. <laughs> you keep your mind focused on Jesus Christ and the third angel's message. And that will hold you. I'll read you one little page. Education. I'm sorry, not education. Um, early writings. Page 63 and 64. There's a little quote that you might want to hold on to. I saw the necessity of the messengers, especially watching and checking all fanaticism wherever they might see it. Satan is pressing in on every side, and unless we watch for him and have our eyes open to his devices and snares and have on the whole armor of God, the fiery darts of the wicked will hit us. There are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. Present truth. God, I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. But such subjects as the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days... The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show what our present position is, establish the faith of the doubting, and give certainty to the glorious future. Now, for those of you who may have been exposed to some of these things, I just want you to filter that through your mind. When you're done listening to these people, have you got a vision of a glorious future, or are you all upset about something? I mean, you answer the question. <laughs> and then it says, These I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. Page 63, early writings. It's been there a long time on that page. Okay. I think if we would spend our time reading the books instead of listening to tapes, we would be a lot better off. Okay? <laughs> Yeah, we'll be informed then by God instead of what humans think about things. So I thank you for the question. I would never have discussed this. But since I did, I want to end on this note. This is in Maranatha, page 352. Page 352. As we enter the kingdom of God, there to spend eternity... The trials and the difficulties and the perplexities that we have had here will sink into insignificance. In the home of the redeemed, there will be no tears, no funeral trains, no badges of mourning. The inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. Isaiah 33, 24. One rich tide of happiness will flow and deepen as eternity rolls on. What a sentence. <laughs> I want to read that sentence again. <laughs> One rich tide of happiness will flow and deepen as eternity rolls on. Let us consider more earnestly the blessed hereafter. Let our faith pierce through every cloud of darkness and behold him who died for the sins of the world. He has opened the gates of paradise to all who receive and believe on him. To them he gives power to become the sons and the daughters of God. Let the afflictions which pain us so grievously become instructive lessons, teaching us to press forward toward the mark of the prize of our high calling in Christ. Let us be encouraged by the thought that the Lord is soon to come. 
Let this hope gladden our hearts. We are homeward bound. He who loved us so much as to die for us has builded for us a city. The new Jerusalem is our place of rest. There will be no sadness in the city of God, no wail of sorrow, no dirge of crushed hopes and buried affections. Soon the garments of heaviness will be changed for the wedding garment. Soon we shall witness the coronation of our King. Those whose lives have been hidden with Christ, those who on this earth have fought the good fight of faith, will shine forth with the Redeemer's glory in the kingdom of God. It will not be long till we shall see Him, in whom our hopes of eternal life are centered, and in His presence all the trials and sufferings of this life will be as nothingness. Look up! Look up and let your faith continually increase! Let this faith guide you along the narrow path that leads through the gates of the city of God into the great beyond, the wide, unbounded future of glory that is for the redeemed. <laughs> this is the real thing. <laughs> this is where we need to put our minds and our attention. If you hear of problems, yeah, there are problems. I could tell, fill you full of problems that I know about. I know more than all of you together. But what good would it do you or me? <laughs> yeah, well, this is what we need to know. This is what we need to put our attention on. Jesus and what he's done and how we participate with him. Get your mind off of the garbage. The computer people know. Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> it's simple. <laughs> all right. Are there any other pieces of paper around here I haven't seen that we need to get to today? <laughs> okay. Okay, brother, you have a piece of paper? <laughs> no, okay. All right. Let's go into Revelation 18 a little more deeply now. We were through verse 4, but we could still do a little bit more there. Revelation 18, verse 5. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. Who is the her here? Okay, it's dealing with Babylon. That is primarily a symbol of the Catholic Church. But at this time in history, it involves the apostate Protestant churches also. So we're talking about all of apostate... Christianity and there are even elements of the world bound in here as we'll see later um, but God's people are not involved in this in uh, volume 6 of the testimonies page 401 the people of God will draw together now God has said it is anything going to change that? It's impossible. God has spoken. He has told us the future. God's people will draw together. They will present to the enemy a united front. In view of the common peril, strive for supremacy will cease. So there won't be anybody out there saying, join our ministry over here, support this ministry, do this, do that, come over with us, join us. There won't be any of that anymore. It'll all be over. And when it's all over, you're not going to pick one and make that the favorite one. It will be the church. We are to draw together as the church of God. The love of Christ the love of our brethren will testify to the world that we have seen Jesus and have learned of him. Then will the message of the third angel swell to a loud cry and the whole earth will be lightened with the glory of the Lord. It will be one people doing that, not people with different ideas. One people. And they will all have the spirit prophecy. 
All of them. For those who don't know about that yet, you just hang in there for a little bit. <laughs> the spirit of prophecy is very important to God's last people. It's the Spirit of God working in a very particular way with very clear information and with a very clear spirit. Volume 1 of the Testimonies, 619. If God's people make no efforts on their part, but wait for the refreshing to come upon them and remove their wrongs and correct their errors, if they depend upon that to cleanse them from filthiness of the flesh and spirit and fit them to engage in the loud cry of the third angel, they will be found wanting. The refreshing or power of God comes only to those who have prepared themselves for it. Nobody's going to slip into being a real Seventh-day Adventist. That's not going to happen. Joining the church did not do it. Okay. God's going to use people on this earth to finish this work up with a power that has never been seen before. Yes, more power than the apostles saw in their day. But it's going to be through a people who understand what the issues are and have surrendered themselves to be used of God the way He says, when He says, how He says. We're going to have to give up a lot of our own ideas. <laughs> have you ever heard of anybody judging somebody in this church? Where in the Bible does it say we're supposed to do that? Where's the command? <laughs> you know, Luther had a very interesting idea. People would attack him all the time about his doctrines. And he'd say, show me a command. <laughs> so we are to do the commands of God. Show me a command. <laughs> and of course, the people he was talking to usually didn't have one. That's why he could say that. But he understood that when God commands us to do something, we have nothing to think about. He has spoken. That's it. He is not going to change his mind. But if he has not commanded us, we better be careful how we're looking at somebody else to see how they're doing with what he didn't command. <laughs> yeah. I could give you some specifics, but I don't think I'm going to just yet. We need to be very careful how we measure other people. Because we may have laid things on ourselves that God never even told us to do. And we're wandering around with guilt trips over something that God never said to us. I'll give you an example of that because I may confuse you a little bit. In Fresno one time we were having a series of meetings and they seemed to be going fairly well. And people were in their Bible, spirit prophecy, they were saying the right things, moving with things, but one lady looked glum no matter what happened. <laughs> I mean, she was down. And so I went to see her. I went to her home and talked to her and her husband. And she was glum in her home. <laughs> and I asked her, what? What's happening? What, what is this? She says, what? I said, well, you're obviously not happy. What's going on? She says, I can't do it. I said, you can't do what? The spirit of prophecy. I said, oh, really? Tell me about it. What is it you can't do? And she says, well, it says that I should open up a health food restaurant. Oh. And then she says, and it says I should take in orphans. And it says I should go talk to the prisoners. And it says, I mean, she had her list. <laughs> she had read the books, but she didn't know what they said. <laughs> and I said, so when you read the Spirit of Prophecy and it says on a page that you're supposed to do this, you set out to do it. Is that right? She says, yeah. I said, and then you read the next page and then you do that one. Yeah. And that one and that one and that one and that one and that one. And that one. She says, yeah. I said, no wonder you're going nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Have 
Has God come to you personally? Did he tap you on the shoulder and did you hear his voice telling you that you should have orphans in your house this week? She said, no. She said, but it says it in the book. Yeah, it says it in the book. So I reminded her about Moses. You know, Moses is an interesting person. <laughs> he did a lot of things. We can pick on him because he was really there. <laughs> you know, when God came to Moses, he was probably one of the brightest individuals on the planet at the time. He was trained. He was educated. He was cultured. He was refined. He had it all. He was strong. He was a military man. He was a genius. And God came to him and told him, you're going to be the leader of my people. And he was equipped. <laughs> you're going to be the leader of my people. I have chosen you. And so Moses must have thought about it because the next thing we see, he's out there. And one of his people got in trouble with an Egyptian. And Moses took the thing into his hands. And what did he do with the Egyptian? <laughs> He just flat killed him. He's going to protect his people. <laughs> of course, it didn't take him very long to figure out he was done himself. He was through because now they know who he was and he had to leave town. <laughs> so there's the leader of God's people. He's gone. <laughs> he neutralized himself. And so God came to him and he says, Moses, what are you doing? He said, well, you told me I was going to be the leader of the people. He said, yeah, but you didn't wait for me to tell you how or when. <laughs> we can't read these books and say, God just talked to me. He told me how and when. This book is for everybody. And the principle is there, that Jesus expects people in prison to be visited by Christians. But he didn't tell you or you'd be over there. These are general orders for all the Christians. General orders. These are true for all Christians. But it's not true for you until God tells you, this is what I want you to do right now. Now it is a specific order. You see, we think that reading something is the same thing as listening to God. No, the reading is to get you over to God. Jesus says, you read the scriptures and in them you think you have life, but they are they which testify of me. Get over to me. <laughs> you don't have eternal life because you read the Bible. You don't have eternal life because you have faith. You don't have anything until you had Jesus Christ. We can believe everything there is to believe in and we still may not have salvation. The whole idea of all of this is to connect with Jesus and have one life between the two of you. One life. Why did he say, I am the branch? The vine, <laughs> the vine, and you are the branches. It's because there's no life until it's going from the vine into the branches. We can't have life disconnected. It's not possible. So let's not become bibliologists and think we have salvation because we read the Bible every day. You know, some people actually think they're going to heaven because they pray all the time. Well, prayer is a good thing, but it doesn't get you heaven. Remember, we spent all, a whole year talking about justification by faith through the merits of Jesus alone. There is no other salvation. It's only 
through Jesus. There's no other way. There's nothing you can do about it. We keep forgetting that somehow. And we want to do something to get good enough so that God will accept us. It's, that's never going to happen. <laughs> but if we really have understood what he has accomplished and we receive it, then we're in a whole different place in the universe. We have eternal life in Jesus Christ. We have it. Not because we were good, but because he gave it as a gift. The people of God in Revelation 18 will all know this and all have this experience and can all talk about it. They can all say, my hope is in Christ alone nothing else to thy cross alone I cling that's the way one song ends <laughs> to thy cross alone nothing else Jesus you know the psalmist I, I have to say this Psalm 77 verse 9 You know, we are all together for a reason here. <laughs> okay. It's not because you need to be entertained or I need to talk to somebody. That's not the reason. <laughs> we are all together because God is seeking to accomplish something in these get-togethers that we have. His Spirit's working. His Spirit is dealing with each one of us in ways that nobody else knows in here. <laughs> it's, it's a very unique personal thing that's going on here. In Psalm 77, verse 9, notice what he says here. Hath God forgotten to be gracious? <laughs> think about that question for a second. Has God forgotten to be gracious? Who would ask a question like that? Well, somebody has here. It's in the Bible. <laughs> well, there's several kinds of people who would ask that, actually. People who suffer a lot and pray all the time, asking God to help them, to deliver them, to give them something, a, a doctor who knows something, some medicine, pain relief, something, a person who lives like that all the time, day in and day out, weeks and months, years at a time, and praying all the time to God, and nothing changes. I think maybe that kind of a person might say this, has God forgotten me? <laughs> has he forgotten to be gracious? I can visualize a person getting over to that place and maybe saying that. I can well imagine a Christian who's been in the church for years and years and cannot overcome what they think is the, the besetting sin. It's still there. It's still hanging on. And this person says, you know, I've tried everything. I've prayed, I've surrendered, I've fasted, I've done everything. Has God forgotten to be gracious? <laughs> I can imagine a person getting there after years and years of frustration, of wondering if they're really a Christian or not. I can imagine another kind of person who works for God all the time, full time who sees wonderful victories in people's lives at one time and then other times nothing happens. Some people are just so callous, nothing can change them. And saying to God, God, have you forgotten? <laughs> I can come up with lots of scenarios where this question might come up. But 
Let's ask this question. Can God forget? <laughs> Is he forgetful? <laughs> well, I know there's some people who think he can forget. They've written books on it. But come on now, what kind of a God is it? Like, that's got a bad memory. <laughs> and it's a stupid question. Has God forgotten? Of course not. <laughs> God cannot forget. But then it says, has he forgotten to be gracious? What is that? When Moses asked to see God, what was it that came in front of him? Jehovah, who is merciful and gracious. There it is. This part of his nature. How can he forget to be gracious? <laughs> this is a blasphemous question. I understand how people can get over it to ask it. Yes, I can understand that. <laughs> Human weakness being what it is. But it is still a blasphemous question. It is a question that carries in it unbelief in who God really is. And when we ever ask that kind of a question ourselves to God, we need to catch ourselves up and say, wait a minute, what am I doing? I better get back to who God really is and get out of this unbelief. The remnant church is being built right now. Adventism has been around for a while, that's true. But the remnant is being built right now. Everybody in this room has had the privilege of God coming to them. Everyone in this room with the invitation to become one. No one is in this room by accident. God made the appointment and He's working in your life. He is drawing you your way <laughs> so that you understand, so that you can respond. But He is, has definitely called you to something. And that something includes being part of the remnant that's going to finish the work on this planet. Now there are 10 million Adventists out there wandering around. But 10 million Adventists are not going to do this. It's a remnant. Now don't look around to see how many bad guys there are. You just figure out how to be one of the remnant yourself. <laughs> That's the only one you need to be concerned about. <laughs> but it is between you and God. And I, I'm telling you this on the authority of the word. He has called you to be one. What you do about it is up to you. <laughs> but he has called you. The ones who refuse are over then Revelation 18. Let's talk a little bit more. We'll read some more statements here. Verse 7. How much she had glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen. Oh, she's a queen. And am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Well, this is kind of interesting because they're the ones who turn on her first. These merchants, they will finally see what it is, what apostate religion really is, and they'll just turn against it with abhorrence. But once they see her burning, they're going to be sorry. Why do you suppose? Yeah, but they read something in that. They're next. 
<laughs> yeah. They realize we helped her. <laughs> We're next. They say, alas, that great city, Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Verse 11, the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Oh, they cut them out too. <laughs> the merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones, of pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, and all fine and wood, and all that uh, scented wood, and all manner of vessels of ivory, and all manner of vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and iron, and marble, cinnamon, odors, and ointments. It sounds like a pretty fancy list here. Horses, chariots, slaves, and the souls of men. Souls. What's this word soul mean? Person. All right? Person. That's all it means. All right? Slaves. That's kind of an interesting word. Bodies, really. The bodies, the persons of men. The fruits that they... Thy soul lusted after departed from thee in all things which are dainty and good, Lord, departed from thee. Thou shalt find them no more. The merchants were made rich by her, shall stand far off with the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Goes on, they cried, the smoke of her burning. Um... Verse 21, this, we need to see this verse before we get too far away. A mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone. Now, the millstone they're talking about here is the kind that an animal had to pull round and round. A okay, big, big stone. So this millstone tied around... And they were cast into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. This is why these others were crying. They're going to be tied to that too. Babylon is more than churches in Revelation 18. It's all apostate systems. The world will be involved in this ruin. The voice of the harpers, musicians, and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. No craftsman or whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. The light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. The voice of the bridegroom of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived." Sorceries, deceptions, Mariolatry. We've discussed these things. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. I think God is trying to tell us something in chapter 17 and 18. He has something in store for Babylon. There's two chapters of it here. I don't find anything like this anywhere else in the Bible. Early Writings, page 277. The message of the fall of Babylon as given by the second angel is repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. It's not going to be an easy thing to do to make the corruption of the church as part of the message. We would rather talk about the love of Jesus. We would rather talk about the nice parts of the gospel. But the Seventh-day Adventist people have been raised up to give a complete message. And the corruption that is in the churches is part of it. Patriarchs and Prophets 124 The existing confusion of conflicting creeds and sects is fitly represented by the term Babylon which prophecy applies to the world-loving churches of the last days. 
Great Controversy 603, a terrible condition of the religious world. It's here described, with every rejection of truth, the minds of the people will become darker. Rejection of what? What is the truth? Present truth. That's what the truth is. We read in early writings, page 63, present truth. What is present truth? If I went around telling people the world is going to be destroyed by a flood, is that present truth? <laughs> was it one time? Yeah, when Noah said it, it was true. <laughs> That's not true anymore. Could Martin Luther have given the third angel's message? Wasn't time yet. He couldn't give it because it wasn't time. We have a message to give and it is time. We must give it because it is the present truth. What is that present truth? Jesus is in the judgment hour. He is the high priest. He's closing it all up. Now, I don't know if that strikes you. Some of you may have been Adventists for too long. I don't know. But if you tell people there's a judgment going on, do you know what a Sunday keeper will think? Which one? <laughs> yeah. Because they're not quite sure what you're talking about. There's a white throne judgment, but that's not until later, and it's not really a judgment. It's a weird idea. It's a strange idea. I'm not going to get into it. The point is this. If we are in the judgment hour now, then how did Nebuchadnezzar go to heaven when he died? Because the Bible indicates he was a saved man. The Bible says Samson was a saved man, Hebrews 11. Does that mean that when Samson died, he went to heaven? We know that it's not true, but Sunday keepers think that's where he went when he died. And so when you tell them that judgment is on, in process now, well, if Samson is just now being judged, how did he get into heaven way back then? We've got to think these things through. The truth only goes one direction. Error does all kinds of weird things. What happened to Adam when he died? See? You know all these answers, but you need to ask people questions like this. <laughs> and then when you tell them, well, the judgment is now according to the scriptures. And in Paul's day, he said, there is coming a day when the judgment will sit. Well, if the judgment was coming in the days of Paul, where did Stephen go when he died? <laughs> the book of Acts, Paul, Peter, all of them answered it. They said, David's sepulcher is with us to the present day. He's still dead. <laughs> they understood all these things. But when you talk about the judgment hour, you need to know all these things are involved. The judgment hour is now. It's our message. Jesus is the high priest. When did he become the high priest? Who knows that? Go out walking up and down the streets. Ask somebody. When did Jesus become the high priest? They say, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's part of our message. 1844. Why? The book of Daniel tells us all about it. <laughs> we have a message to give to this world. Can you tell somebody the 2300 days and make it make sense? Do you have the math in your head? Can you work it out? Do you know how the 490 years works? Do you know how the 483 years works? How you get there? The 69 weeks? Do you know how to handle the last week? What happens in the middle and so forth? Can you deal with all these numbers when you're talking to somebody? That's our message. Are we Seventh-day Adventists or do we just go to church on Saturday? <laughs> the remnant is going to be able to do all of this. <laughs> 
Because it's the message. It's the loud cry. The righteousness of Jesus. I'll ask you one little question here. I'm not expecting you to give me answers. I ask you so we all think together. When, Dan, when Jesus was on the earth and he was talking about the gospel, it was before the cross. The churches today think the gospel came after the cross. No, it was before the cross. The gospel has always been here since Adam. <laughs> okay. Now, Jesus said, The time is fulfilled. Yeah, he says, The kingdom is in your midst. The time is fulfilled. You find that in Mark, you find it in Matthew. The time what time is fulfilled? Jesus was a Seventh-day Adventist. He was quoting Daniel the ninth chapter. The time is fulfilled. The 490-year cycle is about up. He was giving the first angel's message. The time. Paul says in Galatians 4.4, says, in the fullness of time, Jesus came. Under the law, a woman was involved. Yeah, he knew Daniel 9 too. All of the disciples knew Daniel, the ninth chapter. You cannot have the message of God without Daniel 9. In Jesus' time and in our time, because it's all the same time. Yeah, I started in 457 B.C. And all the churches today have that messed up. They say it started in 444. <laughs> yeah. We take a lot for granted out here. We assume everybody knows the things we know. <laughs> no, it's a mess out there. You can't make anything happen starting from 444. It's impossible. But it's what all the churches teach. <laughs> they make it work this way. They try to make it. It doesn't work. There's no, no one can make it work. They say that the reason you can't get to the end of it, that no one can figure out what happens at the end, is because it never happened. They say that the last week of that 490 year period is still in the future. And we will know when it happens. <laughs> well, that's kind of strange to break up the 490 years of Daniel because if you do that, you cannot prove who Jesus is. Jesus came and was baptized at the beginning of the last week. And if that last week is still in the future, Jesus hasn't come yet. You see how crazy that is? But it's what the Sunday keeping churches teach. We have a message. The 2300 days is the first part of it. <laughs> this gets worse. The Babylonian churches teach that somebody in the middle of the week caused the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and that somebody was the devil. Yeah, that's what they teach. Well, what is the truth of that scripture? He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Who did that? It was Jesus. They're saying the devil did what Jesus came to do. And they don't know that. Jesus caused the sacrificial system to cease. He's the end of it. He was the goal of it all the time. And so where does that leave us? If he did that in the middle of the week, that's A.D. 31, by the way. The churches today are saying he did that in A.D. 30. You mess up one place, you're going to mess up everywhere. <laughs> in A.D. 31, in the spring, he did that. That leaves three and a half years or three and a half days left of that last week. 
The Jewish people had that long to still be, get right with God. At the end of that week, Stephen was stoned. The Sanhedrin gave their answer to God, we will not have your religion. Why is that so important that we know when Stephen was stoned? That was in AD 34. Why is it important? If somebody were to ask us, what difference does it make if we know that when Stephen was stoned? Well, it makes a big difference. Oh, let me show you here. This reaches to A.D. 34. 2300 years is what that prophecy is all about. 490 of those years were given to the Jewish people. And the word in the Hebrew means cut off. Desmond Ford said it doesn't mean that. He tried to get rid of our message with one word. He said, nobody has ever taught that. Well, I don't know why it took us so long to answer him, but in the pulpit commentary, which was written a long, long time ago, it says in this chapter that that word means cut off. All the Sunday keeping churches taught it back then. <laughs> it means cut off. So 490 years were cut off from what? The whole period, the 2300 years. So if you take... 9 from 10. Eight. Okay. Okay, tell me the numbers to put up here. I want you to do this for me. Okay, so we have the right numbers. Is that right? There are 1,810 years left after you do the, the part for the Jews. After that part is gone, you still have 1,810 years left. Where does it take us? Well, it's an interesting thing that if you add 1,810 years to 34 AD, you come up to the year... 1844. That's when Daniel 9 ended. And remember, we're talking about the very prophecy that Daniel said that time was fulfilled. He was crucified in the middle of this last week. So that very time that he talked about and which proves that he is the Messiah reaches to 1844. So, when we prove Jesus is the Messiah based on Daniel 9, we prove 1844. What happened in 1844? Well, Daniel 9 tells us, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. And the word there really means vindicated. The sanctuary will be vindicated. On the Day of Atonement of this year, October 22nd, Jesus became the High Priest in the Most Holy Place to vindicate God. He began the investigative judgment. We have something to tell the world. And it is not that Saturday is the day we should be going to church. That's part of it. But we have something to say to this world that it does not know. And it's very important. We are in the judgment hour. And that means everything that Daniel talked about is Christian. It's the one thing that I keep hearing from people. No, we only want the gospel, New Testament. You can't have the gospel if you don't have what Jesus did in the Old Testament. It's not possible. So Babylon is the corruption of all the churches 
who refuse to hear this. Okay? They know it's out there, but they have refused this message and it digs them deeper into darkness. And as a people, that must be exposed for what it is, not by going around calling people names, but by living the holy life that Jesus gives to show Christianity is real and it really does something. Okay? So the whole thing about this to, is to be Christians. Yeah. The same kind that they used to feed to the dogs and the lions and whatever else out there. Real Christians. God has given us a challenge because we don't even hardly recognize what a Christian is supposed to be these days. We're looking at too many other things. There's a whole world out there that will engage our minds. And we're, we're going to think we're supposed to be like them, only we'll put some Christianity with it. Now, we are not to love this world. The love of this world neutralizes Christianity. We have to learn what that means too. We have to keep moving through these things. But each one of us, when we study the Bible, we must look at these pages with a view that God wants to tell me something. He wants to tell me something. It's more than the words here. He's trying to get something to me in the Spirit that's real, that will work. We have to keep moving this past the intelligence level. Adventists are smart people. <laughs> I learned it a long time ago. <laughs> God pulls on a certain kind of mind to turn them over into Adventists. There's a certain level of intelligence there. But we mustn't rely on the intelligence by itself. We must get over to where the Spirit can teach us. And things will make sense, yes, but they must hold because they came from God. Nowhere else. So this little bit of math here, just this little bit, is something the world needs to hear. No matter where we are, they need to hear it. Do you know that the Jews are an entire system that have been forbidden to even read this chapter because they know what's in there? <laughs> It will convince the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah if they see what it says. They forbid them to read it. They forbid them to read Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Yeah. It seems to me, like when we talk to people, we ought to ask them if they know anything about these things and get them involved. You see, this is a bit neutral. God will allow us to say this to people and they won't get all excited at first because they don't see anything dangerous about it. You hit them with dangerous things first, they'll be gone. But if you can get them some information to work with, their minds can absorb it and deal with it, and the Lord will use it to take them to the next step. It's the same with the sanctuary. If you can understand the sanctuary and draw people a little diagram and get them involved in it, and they see it, and they can see the plan of salvation, the churches don't arm them against that. You can do that and it'll be okay. Now listen. <laughs> I have spoken in churches, non-Adventist churches, and just gone to the sanctuary. I've dealt with ministers of other churches and just gone to the sanctuary. And they'll sit there and listen. Because they've never heard this before, most of them. And they've never seen it the way God says it in the Old Testament. And once they see it, lights start coming on. And we don't have to make people understand everything all at once. That's not our job. But we need to plant seeds. <laughs> but we need to know what we're planting. It's the third angel's message. If we do that, we will see more clearly why Revelation 18 is the way it is. We're not going to spend any more time in Revelation 18 after today. But I would like to give you a couple of more quotes here. Volume 5. Testimonies, page 208. 
With unerring accuracy, the Infinite One still keeps an account with all nations. While His mercy is tendered with calls to repentance, this account will remain open. But when the figures reach a certain amount which God has fixed, the ministry of His wrath commences, the account is closed, divine patience ceases. So we mustn't think this world is going to go on and on and on and on. God has a time. It's fixed. It's already been decreed when it's over. And Jesus told us to watch because we don't know when that is. He said, if you knew when that thief was coming in, you'd have been there with your eyes wide open. <laughs> he said, but since you don't know, you just better be there all the time watching to be sure it doesn't sneak up on you. We're told to prepare. Great Controversy, page 604, the Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, Satan will work with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And they that received not the love of the truth that they might be saved will be left to receive strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Not until this condition shall be reached and the union of the church with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete. The change is a progressive one and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. Notwithstanding the spiritual darkness and alienation from God that exists in the churches which constitute Babylon, the great body of Christ's true followers are still to be found in their communion. The great body... That means there are more Christians out there than in here at the present time. Revelation 18 points to the time when as a result of rejecting the threefold message of Revelation 14, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from their communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world. Okay, I need to give you a different page. That's Great Controversy 389. This next part is 604. I'm sorry. Great Controversy 389. For that. Now I'm on 604. God still has a people in Babylon, and before the visitation of judgments, these faithful ones must be called out. They partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Hence, the movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven, lightening the earth with his glory and crying mightily. In connection with this message, the call is heard, Come out of her, my people. These announcements, uniting with the third angel's message, constitute the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. So, as we have been going through the Bible, and of Revelation 1 and following through, are you starting to get a picture of the entire book of Revelation? Chapter 1 was the prologue. Chapters 2 and 3 go together. They are the seven churches. Okay? You just need to see a general picture. You, you can remember how it sits. Those are the first three chapters. Chapters 4 and 5 are a scene of God's throne. Okay? Chapter 6 starts talking about the seals. The seven seals. Chapter 7, chapter 8... Get these things. Put them in your mind. It won't take very long. You will know what the book of Revelation is saying. So when you need it, you can call on it. It won't take you very long at all. Uh, you, you have chunks of it already. What's Revelation 11 about? When you hear that number, Revelation 11, immediately, French Revolution. Okay? That's all you need to remember. French Revolution, and the rest of the chapter begin fitting for you as you go back to it. But you should be able to do that with the chapters. Revelation 14. Third angel's message. That's where it's found. Okay. Okay, you work on this. We're up to chapter 18, and already you can see it's all wrapping up. The judgment of Babylon. So what would you expect to be happening next in the book of Revelation. The coming of Jesus, the wrapping up of the history. And there's only two chapters left then. Three chapters, 20, 21, and 22. 
And that's describing how God is going to protect His church. How, how He's going to bring the bride down from heaven. And then the wrap-up of this whole thing. The earth made new. And how God is going to dwell with His people. All that. That's all that's left in the book of Revelation is that section. So we've reached the end of earth's history. Now, I'm saying this because I want to ask you a question. I just read it twice. What chance does the earth get after the angel of Revelation 18 has done his work? None. It's the last message God will ever give to this earth. So where are we in earth's history? Do you see where we are? We are right there on the edge. God is never going to talk to this planet again. He has to do it through us. Yeah. So Revelation 18 ought to be saying some things to us. Sitting in this room, the call is going out. Come out of her, my people. In this room, right now. I can see five people, real quick, that God has said it to. Come out of her, my people. You may not understand it all yet, but that's what He's doing to you. Revelation 18 is being fulfilled right now, right here. Not in its completeness yet. The loud cry must go to the world. And then God's going to say it for the last time to all of His people in all the churches. But He's going to say it through people who know what that means. They have an experience in it. They've come out. All right, I'm going to save a couple things for next time. I think that's all we're going to do here. I just want to say one thing in partying here for today. I said something that went by kind of fast. I said something about the church. And then I said something about the bride. All the Babylonian churches teach the church is the bride. And that's exactly the way the pioneers said it. If you go back and you read the pioneers, they say the Babylonian churches teach that the church is the bride. Well, I'm afraid there are a few of us who haven't gotten out of that yet. Some of us believe that too. When we get to Revelation 19, you please read this carefully for yourself. You see what it says about the bride. <laughs> it says there that the bride is clothed with the righteousness of the saints. So the bride is not the saints. It's clothed with the righteousness of the saints. And when John said, I saw the bride, what did he see in Revelation 20 and 21? He saw the new Jerusalem coming down, adorned as a bride. <laughs> so he says point blank what the bride is. It's not the church. It's new Jerusalem. That's a city. Isaiah understood this. He describes the city. He says the foundations, the gates. And it says that city has children. It's a mother. <laughs> Who are the children? The Christians. The Christians cannot be the bride if they're the children. <laughs> See, Isaiah knew about that. And on top of it, Paul tells us all of this. We're going to close with this. Let's go to Galatians and let's see what Paul says. Oh, 
Okay, in, Jeru in, in Galatians, the uh, fourth chapter, let's pick up the context. Verse uh, 22, we'll start there. It says, It is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bone woman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is the bondage in bondage with her children. Okay, now notice, he just said something about Jerusalem and children. Verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, where is Jerusalem? Yeah, it's not on earth. He's saying Jerusalem is above. The holy city that God's going to bring back down here. He said Jerusalem, which is above, which is the mother of us all. Whatever Jerusalem is, it cannot be the church because us is the church. <laughs> and it says here, we are the children. We are not Jerusalem. Then it says, for it is written... And this is written in Isaiah. You can follow your notes. This is what Isaiah said. Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry. Thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many children, more children than she which hath a husband. New Jerusalem is a mother. That mother has children. We are the children. We are the church. The church cannot be the bride. The bride is the mother. <laughs> we'll go over this some more when we get to the verses in Revelation to show that to say the church is the bride is to misunderstand Jesus' high priestly ministry and what he's doing and what the investigative judgment is supposed to be doing. We have a message to this world, but we need to understand it first. <laughs> it's an interesting thing because as Dick is smiling, I remember we were talking one day about this subject, and we went to his book and Great Controversy, and that was the answer. We'll get to that page here. <laughs> okay. All right. Are there any questions or last minute comments here? Okay, we moved a little bit fast today, but that's all right. Next time we'll start Revelation 19, and we want to spend a little more time with the last two chapters to show how God is going to wrap this whole thing up. All right, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you that we're not going to go to heaven because we got all the information. You take us because we have an attitude. We have understood your call to us. And we've said yes to Jesus. He said, come unto me and I will give you rest. He never said another thing to us. He said, come to me. We thank you that all of us can do that. That doesn't take any study. We just need to come to Him. And we thank You that coming to Him, He will direct our course. And now the effort starts to understand and to receive all that He has to give us. To understand that salvation is the, truly a free gift. But character development is a gift with strings. We must put in the effort we must give it everything we have. We must sense the value of what we're striving for. Help us, Lord, to not get confused and think that because we surrendered, all of a sudden everything is perfect now. We're never going to make mistakes. Help us not to be discouraged. Help us to know that as your children, when we do fall, we're supposed to get up right away and in faith say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Let's go some more. We thank you that you're always there, that you really are gracious, that you never fail, 
that you can't forget. Bless us, Lord, as we continue to learn, as we spend the time, as we listen to your voice through the various means you've made. And help us, Lord, to sense that there is a preparation we need to be making, a conscious one, a real effort. Help us to sense that only in that preparation will we be ready to help someone else. You already have them in mind. You know, maybe we're the only one that can do anything. Help us to know. That as we learn to talk like Christians, you will give the power. We thank you once more for your Sabbath. And we pray that we may truly have an experience of rest in it. May we sense your total forgiveness and our completeness in Jesus. And we thank you for hearing us in his holy name. Amen.